All right. So welcome to Healthy Mindset Miracles. I am your host, Tanisha, and this is episode four, Resilience in the Face of Grief and Loss. It is important to be aware of potential triggers that might arise during this discussion. So before we dive in, please note that there is a disclaimer. I am not a licensed mental health professional or a certified therapist. I am simply a person that is passionate about sharing stories of personal victories and positive experiences in life. This podcast features real life stories and people's journey to miraculous victories. While we aim to inspire and educate, Information provided is not to replace professional advice or treatment. If you or someone you know is in need of mental health support, we strongly encourage seeking qualified mental health professionals. Make sure to subscribe so that you never miss an inspiring episode. And if you enjoy what you're hearing, then join us on Facebook. Just search Healthy Mindset Miracles and leave a review. We are pleased to have Tanya Wynne-Jones joining us today. So Tanya is a coach, a consultant, and an entrepreneur, but she's also a mom, a survivor, and is a passionate learner who has not only journeyed through the heart-wrenching experience of losing her daughter, but she has turned the pain into a powerful mission to equip 100 million people by 2040 in the emotional intelligence and resilient mindsets required to create amazing, fulfilling lives, empowered by their challenges and turning taboo subjects like death and grief into a catalyst for meaningful conversations, stronger communities, and transformative personal growth. With the holiday season approaching, Tanya is here to share some invaluable insights on how we can be there for our loved ones. Trust me, by the end of our chat, you'll be looking at grief support in a whole new light. Tanya also has a blog at www.tanyatonjewynjones.com forward slash blog. So that is www.tanyawynjones.com forward slash blog. And she also has an Instagram. Also look her up at at Tanya Wynn Jones. And Tanya, thank you so much for joining us. You are beautiful. Your spirit is beautiful. Your story is heart-wrenching. However, your victories are probably one of the best stories that I've heard. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, one of the topics that you wanted to talk about was grief and mourning. And I know, you know, hearing the story of losing your daughter, um, that was unexpected. Uh, Can you talk about that a little bit, you know, for our viewers to hear what you went through during those times? All right. Uh, Well, um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, And, um, yeah. Mm. Talk about my, do you mean, do you want me to talk about my daughter? I... Well, so you went through some experience times of, you know, you had a beautiful baby and, you know, that's one of the things that's hard for us as mothers to, to experience the loss of our, our, our child. And you did go through that heart wrenching moments, but you turned what you had gone through into something beautiful to be able to help others. And I know there are mothers out there that have probably experienced the same thing that you're experiencing, or maybe experiencing a child that's sick right now. Um, you know, those are moments that, that, it's hard to recover from, but you've been able to turn that grief into something amazing in the light of your daughter, correct? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, my, that's a, yeah, it's, it's a loaded big question. Um, that's why I just needed to kind of clarify where you wanted to start with this. Um, yeah. So when I reflect on my life or my life story, I kind of have to split my life into two now two parts and right. i have my life that was before 2018 and then i have my life after because in february 2018 that's when my daughter died um and it's 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 hard for people outside to understand but when something like that happens your life shatters your entire reality just falls apart and then you try to often you think that okay well but then you you mend it you build up and you get 
you put things back together and you get back to life. But um, that's not normally how it actually tends to happen. You, your life is destroyed and you have right. to create a new one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's definitely how it was for me. So um, once I started to get my head back up to the surface, um, I knew I had to find a new way to live. I had to find a new purpose and meaning in my life. Um, and that's when I really tapped into this need to help people, which I'd always had, but I've been able to just, you know, kind of live my comfortable, normal life. Um, but now I needed a stronger meaning. And that's why it brought me into um, doing coaching and setting my mission to help others to go through mm -hmm. this. I think that's beautiful because I feel like when you help others, it kind of helps you as well. And it helps you, you know, grow through some of those painful moments. Um, you know, when you, your, your little girl was really little, she was young and, um, you know, you didn't have a whole lot of time with her, but you were able to, those times that you did have with her, you were able to capture those memories and hold them dear. But in the light of the challenges that you went through when you lose yourself from losing, you know, something so precious in your life, you've been able to turn that around and start helping others. Where did that start for you when you started helping others? Um, yeah, you know what? The, the first thing that really knocked me out of my kind of pause where you just you're just getting up in the morning you're in the deep pit of grief and and you you use all your strength to just get up the thing that got me out of that was actually my other daughter um mm -hmm. she was uh, three and a half at the time so my daughter who passed away she was one and a half um and my older daughter was three and a half and well all of a sudden well it felt like all of a sudden it wasn't all of a sudden but it felt like it I noticed that she was asking me about about 50 times a day, are you okay, mama? Are you okay? Aww. And and it just, it was like it. I just got stabbed. <laughs> it was a shock when I realized what was going on. You know, she was three and a half. It was not her job to be looking out for me. You know, she shouldn't be worried about how I'm doing. Right. And that's what really, that's what really made me get grounded and reevaluate and see that okay i can't just live to live because that's what i was doing i was getting up i was living life for her you know she right. was what got me out of bed in the morning i knew i had to get up and make her food and get her off to to kindergarten um and i thought i was doing okay with that you know i didn't see really value in my life except for being there for her my happiness didn't matter anymore. I didn't feel like I, yeah, I, di I didn't feel like I needed the happiness even um, because I was just grieving. Right. And I think some I, people feel like they don't deserve happiness when they yeah. lose somebody they love. They feel like, you know, oh, how can I be happy when the one that I love is not here anymore and, and, and they can't join in then that happiness with me. And I think a lot of people have that thoughts and those feelings. Um, what's beautiful about your daughter, uh, your oldest one, who is resilient, because that's the word that comes through my mind. She's very resilient. You know, scripture tells us that we should have a childlike heart and a childlike mind. Um, throughout our lives. And if you watch a child, um, and, and my own daughter, she was 13 when her father passed away. And uh, I remember the day, and, and this may be if I cry or you cry, we're going to cry together. I'm just going to mm -hmm. tell you that right now. Just warning, trigger, trigger warning for those that are going to hear this story. But um, so my daughter's father, he had prostate cancer and um, he was in he was in hospice at the time and we knew it was it was coming to the end, um, but it still wasn't any easier. And um, and what was hard for me was that my daughter, her dad was her best friend and they did everything together. He taught her how to shoot guns. He taught her how to hunt. He taught her how to do all kinds of amazing things. And, and they always did everything together. And um, when he was, they had just given him some morphine to, to relax him and stuff, and he wasn't waking up. 
And that I remember my daughter, the last time we saw them or saw him, she came to me and she says, mama, she's like, I don't want to go back. Mm-hmm. I think I've said goodbye to dad. I, I don't want to go back. I don't want to watch him die. I just want to remember him the way he is. And I thought, wow, how can a 13 year old girl, you know, be so resilient and to say that. Meanwhile, I'm bawling my eyes out. You know, I, I don't know how to handle what had just transpired. And it, the next day, um, so that night, we found out that our best friend's mother passed away unexpectedly, which is really the oddest thing ever. And so I took her to her best friend's house just to, to help comfort her best friend, and she stayed the night there. The next morning, we got the phone call that her father passed away. Mm-hmm. And I called her, and I said, um, baby, I need to come see you. Um, I'm going to come pick you up. Uh, I, you know, we were going to have to talk and she says, daddy's gone, isn't he? And I said, yes, baby, daddy's gone. I said, um, I don't even want to tell you that over the phone. I want to tell you that in person. And she says, it's okay, mommy. She goes, it's okay. He's not hurting anymore. And the resilience of a child to say that, Mm -hmm. um, it really struck me like she's the one that got me through that. She's the one that even today she talks about her dad as if he's still here mm-hmm. and she shares this memory. So to hear your daughter at three years old to be so resilient is such a beautiful thing. And that, that childlike mind and that childlike heart is what we should we should cherish. And for you to say that, you know, that's what helped you. Do you feel like her resilience and her strength is is what you're saying that strengthened you? Yeah, it was definitely because I was already saying, you know, I was already thinking to myself that that was my reason for a living was to be there for her. And then I realized that I'm doing a crap job because mm-hmm. now she's looking after me. She's worried about me. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, you know, we, we've always um, tried to have a very open um, discussion and dialogue about, you know, after after Aliyah died, we've always tried to have an open discussion dialogue uh, with her about everything surrounding it, you know, because we don't we didn't know what what she would remember, how she would remember if she would com- confuse things. You know, we didn't even we couldn't even tell her what happened, you know, so a, ki- a child is going to make up their stories. But you're so right. They're so resilient in many ways. But at the same time, you know, your daughter was 13. That's such a strong story you're telling um and yeah mine at three and a half she she was very she was very mature in many mm-hmm. ways but at the same time you don't you can't talk to them quite as well as you can to a 13 year old to see what's what's actually going on what they actually caught and what they're saying um, right. so there's that danger there that they're saying and sounding sounding very mature and then that's not quite as mature as they are, you know. Right. Um, at at yeah. three years old, did she talk about her sister still? Did she, you know, still ask questions at all? Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, we we talk about her a lot. She she remembers her well. Um, we set aside time um, to memorize her and and look at photos and pictures, which I think is such a valuable tool that we have now, you know, that they can, you know, we can help, we can help make sure that she remembers her sister by continuously showing pictures and videos of her and talking about her. Um, and uh, yeah, she, rem- she remembers her very well. How old is she today? She's now nine. She's nine years old. And so through from three years old to nine years old, and then through those times of you trying to get through the healing, um, where did you start turning your grief into the positive of helping others? At what point did you do that? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. (laughs) Um, Well, the first step on that was actually it, it kind of came out of the blue um i was out on a walk with my dogs and i was listening to an audiobook i, I don't remember the name of the audiobook because there's only this one thing i remember from it but um in the book the author was was saying how how happiness is our normal level and i was mm-hmm. like 
thinking, what, what, what do you mean? Um, and he kept going. He was saying like, yeah, you, you don't need anything to be happy because that's our baseline. That's where you should mm -hmm. be over time is happy. And then something happens and you can be upset or overjoyed, but your baseline should be happy. And, right. and I, I remember I paused the book because I was thinking like, I'd been going around thinking I have no reason to be happy. You know, I have no, um, because it wasn't good enough. They weren't strong enough. It's like, yes, I have my, my beautiful other daughter. I have my husband. I have other things, but they're not strong enough because they're not stronger than the loss of my daughter. Mm -hmm. And then with this realization, I thought to myself, okay, if I don't need anything to make me happy, I could do that. But then I didn't want to give up my grief. And then I realized, well, you know, I can actually be happy and grieve at the same time. So, so explain that. that. How do you do that? How do you be happy and grief at the same time? Because I'm certain the listeners are just going to hear that. And I want to hear that as well. So how did you figure that out? Because the grief is a, it's like a portion in me. It's like, it's like something internal in me that um, is never going to leave me. And I actually don't want it to, mm -hmm. because it's my, because that was what was holding me back. I didn't want to give up my grief because my grief is like my tie to my daughter. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So I did not want to give that up. And that was holding me back from from being happy, from enjoying life again, because I was I was like, no, I, I cannot let go of this grief because then that's letting go of my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so so I figured, well, I don't have to let that go because I can hold on to that, have that as in me, as a part of me. But I can still I can still be happy. I can still smile. I can still enjoy my life because you're able to do that duality. If you, if you look at it, we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And especially if you reflect back to kids, right? They're continuously going up and down and in between emotions. You know, they're riding them like waves, like we should yeah. be doing too. Within split seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can do, you know, at times uh, in the beginning, it was more um, up and down like that, almost like a roller coaster, right? So I would, allow myself moments of joy and know that I still have my grief. It didn't mean mm -hmm. I let it go. I was just kind of going in between. Um, and then after a while, it actually became like parallel tracks. So I can mm -hmm. have, I can have both at the same time, really. But that just, that just took time and I guess training in a way. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, yeah, it's, it's more a, um, it's just knowing that you don't have to give it up. In so I heard you say you were listening to an audiobook and that helped you kind of get to that realization that you can have both grief and happiness throughout the healing portion of your of accepting the grief and happiness and simultaneously. Did you continue to listen to books and continue to seek out information to help you with mindset on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, I have been doing that non-stop for the last like six years now or five and a half years um I am always listening to something or doing something there's just so much value in in tapping into other people's experiences and, mm -hmm. and knowledge absolutely yeah that's that's what I found for me like anytime I'm going through some kind of really hard part in my life, I find that audios or podcasts or books or something to dive myself into to check my mindset really helps a lot. Because for me, when I'm reading a book, I kind of put myself in that book. And I envision myself, what I'm reading is coming alive within my life. Um, do you see yourself doing the same thing? Because most people that I've talked to that have found victory or have found miracles in their life, that's what they experienced as well. So I'm hearing that that's what you did too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do that. And then at the same time, I also, I look very much at it as, you know, you can, you can try to figure things out on your own. You can probably do it, but it's going to mm -hmm. take you a long time. Right. You know? So by listening to audiobooks and and doing courses and podcasts and everything, you know, it's, it's like skipping ahead. Yes, <laughs> then, I agree. Know, 
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, like I love putting my audiobooks on double speed. So then I just really get, my, <laughs> get, get everything out of it, you know. Um, so it, it's just super efficient as well. And then you can pick and choose. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like and, and I think that's so valuable as well. It's like whenever I because I think it's important to to be um, not one tracked. You know, you mm -hmm. need to kind of get diversify your, the information you put in, take in, but you can pick and choose what you want to take out of it. You know, you don't yes. have to take everything on board because somebody's story is their story and not everything's going to align to you, but you might find something there. Like that one audiobook there, there wasn't that much in it, but there was that one pivotal thing for me. Mm -hmm. so I've had other things that I've gotten like lots out of. So it's, it's, it varies, but it's still valuable. I think almost everything if not everything you can get some kind of value out of it that's interesting that you say that because if there's been times where I read a book and I get something out of that one chapter that would really meant a lot to me in that one chapter and then I might put that book down and not read it again for three years and I'll pick it back up and a totally new chapter jumps out at me like the one that meant so much to me really didn't mean that much to me three years later something mm -hmm. else did and it's it's the same thing like if you are listening to a song and it makes you move and get excited, but then later on you listen to the song again and it, the same vibe's not there. <laughs> you know, you're like, yeah, I'm not dancing like I was this morning. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, you always get something different based on where you're at at that moment. Um, you know, there was a book that I had had on my shelf for like forever and ever, and I never picked it up. But then when I finally did pick it up, it was because I was finally ready to receive it. Mm -hmm. So one of the other topics that you have on here is heightened grief during holidays. And we do have Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. And some there, so there's some people that celebrate this, some people don't. And there's other holidays that people do. So but we th there's a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to holidays and not having that loved one with you anymore. How are you able to get through the holidays during those times yeah the holidays can definitely be tough um and for the first couple years they were for me as well mm -hmm. um the thing with holidays is and it kind of because this goes back to um well i guess maybe first if we look at because we we briefly touched or you asked me initially about the the difference between grief and mourning. Um, mm -hmm. Just to say quickly there, you know, mourning is the outward expression. Now, if you're in mourning during the holidays, it's going to be a bit different because, you know, you, you have your kind of sets. Um, normally, you have your set things that you go through during mourning. But if you're in grief, that's something that you carry with you. And that's your internal expression uh, mm -hmm. of loss. And when it comes to to grief for most people, very often the hardest times are the best times. So mm -hmm. when you're supposed to be the happiest, you know, when when everybody's smiling and laughing, that's when you feel the grief the most because that's when you miss the person the most because you want them to be there. Mm -hmm. So it's a it seems like a paradox from the outside because you're smiling and people tend to think then, oh, you're smiling, so you must be happy, you must be feeling good. And then they might even tell you that. And then it's like a stab and you go like, oh, my God, they think I'm not missing my daughter anymore. And then you get the guilt of it and, and it all packs on. So there's a lot of nuances that that come to play, um, but it, it tends to really heighten um, mm -hmm. both the sense of grief because you're missing the person, but also like maybe isolation because you don't you feel like you can't partake because then you're not respecting the last one um we also have the the problems of um like i said the guilt that often comes with it and you're not not allowing yourself to be happy and enjoy because you feel like you might not be respecting your loved one um so, so there's a lot of of heavy emotions there um i think that the the thing when it comes to holidays is that it is going to like the first one is probably going to be difficult no matter what. This, this mm -hmm. just um, it's hard to get around that. But you just have to let it be. You have to mm -hmm. let it be a hard one. All the first it, all the firsts after mm -hmm. a lot are, are especially difficult. 
you know, mm-hmm. the first birthday, the first anniversary, the first Christmas, the first, you know, everything, all the first. Mm-hmm. Um, they they are very, very heavy. Um, but as you progress, they don't have to be a constant source of grief and, and misery. You can learn to to enjoy it again. Um, and I would I would love to see more people be able to do that. I would too. I saw, I heard a story recently and I don't know where it was or who it was, but I will tell you that I thought it was very beautiful. And it it actually has to do with a wedding um, because weddings are one of the things where you definitely miss your loved ones, especially if it's a father that passed away and you don't have your father walking you down the aisle um, or a mother. Um, But what they did was they had on both sides, the groom side and the bride side, they had lost members um, Mm -hmm. of the family, Um, very, you know, close members, a father, a mother, you know, things like that. And what they did was so beautiful. So they had set up um, in in the hallway uh, pictures of the family members that were not able to come or that had were no longer with us. And they set up like a, a almost like a memorial, like a memory of them. But they also had empty chairs for them as if they were there with their pictures on the chairs. So it helped them kind of feel like they were there even though they physically weren't there like they felt like their spirit was there and I thought that was very beautiful and I've seen a lot of people do that where uh, you know a family member is no longer there and they they add their picture or have an open chair for them or something like that and I was sitting here thinking as you were speaking about the holidays you know why not do that for a Thanksgiving dinner have a chair open and and put their picture there as if they're there or you know in Christmas have their picture on the tree or, you know, give a gift to them, you know, the, you know, just a, a thank you gift or something to say that we know that you're here, your spirit's with us. Um, because that's a great way to memorize the, mm-hmm. the person that you miss and that you love, um, but also still have them a part of the festivities that are going on. Um, so my, my husband now, his late wife passed away, um, at 37 years of, of the stomach cancer and, um, his, so we had pictures of her around our home and we always spoke to the children about her. We still speak about her all the time as if she's, you know, still exist. And I think that has helped the, his children to, you know, just know that, it's acceptable to speak about those that we miss. It's acceptable mm-hmm. to, you know, have them, you know, spiritually join in on the things that we do and, and keep their, their memories alive. Do you, I know that you guys talk about your daughter and you share pictures and things like that, but do you recommend people doing that as well? Like sharing those memories, talking about those that they lost Um, never, ever forgetting them because we're never going to forget them. You know, I think about, okay, I know one day I'm not going to be here. Hopefully it's a long time and I'm well into my late years of life. Um, But I just, I feel like I would want my family to be happy, to go on and and do the things in life that is going to make them happy, experience things because life doesn't stop. Mm. It does not stop that things keep going. People still keep going to work. People still have bills to pay. They still have food they need to eat. They still have to go to the bathroom. You know, life just does not stop. Mm -hmm. Um, But it doesn't mean that you can't think of them, the person that you lost and positive memories. Do you agree with that, Tanya? Oh, absolutely. I think it's so important. And it's, it's, it's a very good point that you, that you bring up. And it is something that people, um veer away from a lot actually um very often people seem to well they get scared of actually even mentioning um the the departed right because Mm -hmm. they don't want to bring you down they don't want to bring down the mood or upset you and um actually a um a friend of mine she who lost her son she said it she said it nicely she was a bit surprised and she said People tend to tell her that, or actually somebody was mentioned, said something about her son, not realizing that he was dead. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, yeah, no, he he passed away. And the other person was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to mention. She's like, why are you sorry? You know, oh, I didn't want to remind you. It's like, 
you cannot remind me of my son. That mm -hmm. actually implies that I forgot. I'm never going to forget my son. Wow. So, and it's that was beautifully said. Yeah. And it's, it's so important, but people tend to think that, but it's, we need to get out of the worry about that constant worry about being discomfort. And like you, know? you said, open conversations about grief, um, no more taboo. That was one of the topics we were going to talk about. That's mm -hmm. beautiful to have those open conversations. Like when we talk about my daughter's father, um, we talk about him as if he's still here. We talk about the things that he loved and, and we'll see something and we'll, we'll be out and about and we'll go, oh, daddy would have loved that. That's so yeah. awesome. That's right up his alley, you know, and, and, you know, exactly. we talk about things like that. Mm -hmm. We don't act as if, you know, it's a taboo thing and we shouldn't be talking about mm -hmm. him. We act as if he's still walking with us in the mall or he's, you yeah. know, with us at, you know, uh, whatever event that we're in mm -hmm. because he, th that person will always be with you. No mm. matter what you do, they will always be with you. I look mm. at it this way too. Like if, if I'm going out of town by myself and my husband doesn't come with me, that doesn't mean that I'm going to forget who my husband is or where I come from. He's going to be with me. He just won't physically be with me. You know, mm. yeah, I can pick up a phone and talk to him on the phone, but there's going to be moments where I'm going to be busy, but I'm still going to be thinking about him. It's yeah. the same thing. You don't stop thinking about that loved one. You just don't. Mm. But why not think about the positive things? Mm -hmm. Why not think about those good memories and keep those alive? Because those things are what's going to keep a smile on your face. Those things are the ones that are going to help you get through. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a true believer that we are in control of our thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions. And how do we want to handle our day? Mm -hmm. And we get to make that choice. How do you want to mm -hmm. handle that? So you have an upcoming course that goes deep into three phases of grief, despair, receptive, and resignation, enlightenment. I would love you to talk about those courses coming up because I think that's a brilliant thing that you're doing. I think many people need this course. And um, I actually want to be able to not only share it with my listeners, but I also want to share it with other family members that I have. So can you talk about that? What is this course about and where would our listeners find this course? Yeah, oh, I'd love to. Um, yeah, so this course is a it's called Grief Untangled, and it's a course to help people become better at supporting their loved ones through grief. So uh, I'm actually doing a uh, recording right now. And uh, so I'm, it should probably be launching at the beginning of the year. I'm hoping okay. for the beginning of January. So it's, it's not out yet, but I will definitely be um, posting the launch on my, on my Instagram and on, on, the, um, on the blog as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the course goes into... Um, well, it goes deep into explaining what grief is, um, how it manifests in different ways and how you can better understand the person. And then we go into explaining um, the phases, which is a model I've developed. And um, very many people know of the five stages of grief, which is developed by Kubler-Ross. I think it was in 1969 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, which are um, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. The problem I found with this model, well, it's a good model, and it's um, very widely used and accepted. It explains the emotions that a person typically goes through in grief, but it's not a linear ladder. So you can mm -hmm. move back and forth and up and down it's very varied from person to person it's i find it's valuable on a personal level where you can see okay i'm feeling these crazy emotions and i can see that it's normal that most people go through this but as a supporter it's less useful because it's not predictable you don't know it just because they're feeling angry now doesn't mean that they're going to be in the acceptance phase after right yes so I developed a model that I call the three phases, which is a lot simpler, but it's the first phase is the um, despair. So this is the initial toughest phase normally, right? It's mm -hmm. normally right after it happens. Um, the length is going to vary, obviously. 
and is not set, but it's it's typically right after. And um, that's where you're not receptive. That's where, you know, just getting through the day is challenging enough, just getting up in the morning. Mm-hmm. And then once you start like getting, like I was saying, once you start getting your head a little bit out, out of the water, um, you know, trying to float again, <laughs> then that's the receptive phase. Now, this is where you're trying to see what's what's my new purpose? You know, how can I keep living? How how can I find my meaning in my life? Um, and people start getting curious. And, and this is when they might be getting ready to talk to somebody. Um, and then the third phase, which is split, you know, either res- resignation or enlightenment, because it varies. Like some will um, go to res- resignation and some will go to enlightenment and some will do both or go back and forth. But, mm-hmm. um, but this is where you start living again. So either whether that is going back to your old life as good as you can, you know, what you used to do and just finding a way to to bring the grief with you or to carry on with your life. Or if it's, you know, like me, I found new purpose with my life. Um, Mm -hmm. That's more the enlightened version. Um, So the reason that these phases are so important is because where you're at in your grief is going to determine what type of support you need right. and for a supporter knowing and recognizing these faces and knowing what to look for you can also know how to best support your loved ones you know I like, love that yeah thank you that is so amazing that you're putting your time and your thoughts and your efforts into opening those those three phases of grief to help people kind of get through those, those moments. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there's so many people that need that right now. Um, There's a lot of people that need that support. They need to know what's next. And I think in a way you're going to be laying that out to what's next, right? Yeah. So I see here that you said that you're going to go deep onto your three do's and don'ts of support. And you could share one do and one don't. So go ahead. What is one do? Mm. Okay. Yeah. So um, one do, which is <laughs> kind of a do and a don't, but it's get out of your ego. This is the biggest. I love um, that thought. Yeah. Get out of your ego. And this mm. this goes back to what we talked about a little bit before, the discomfort, right? Okay. It's, so often we react straight away because we're so afraid of being discom- being uncomfortable ourselves and that's mm-hmm. our ego trying to protect us you know okay so i would like people to to just take a pause whenever whenever you're actually confronting anyone if you're talking to them if you're trying to support them whatever it is if you can take a moment to pause and just reflect and see okay am i coming out of my ego or I'm actually trying to help this other person because most of the time when you come with a a quick remark like oh they're you know they're in a better place right now that's just you desperately trying to find something to say so that you don't have to stand there and be uncomfortable Mm -hmm. but ego stands up go ahead no I was just gonna say if you take a moment to reflect it's like okay what does that you saying that does that actually help them or does it help you are you saying right. because, because that's what they need and it will help them? Or is it just because you're trying to find something to fill the void with? That is a very good point. I was going to say that ego, they always say that it stands for edging greatness out. <laughs> and so if you have that ego, you're etching out that greatness that could be possible for you and for your life. And also, you know, I feel like when you have an ego, it actually keeps you in a comfort zone. So if you don't get yourself out of your comfort zone and stretch yourself, mm. you're never going to be able to get better. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I actually think that I, I very much agree with what you say. Um, I mean, I think we all we all have our ego. I know our, our ego is there to protect us. Mm-hmm. And I think that the ego has value. And I think it's something you need to, to um, at least the way I look at my ego, I value my ego. You know, I look at it as my protector. 
I actually think of my ego as my German shepherd that's always trying to protect me, <laughs> you know, but sometimes I have to tell him to go, go lie over there, go sit in the corner because I don't need you right now. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm okay. I'm actually safe. You mm -hmm. know, it's a very different thing when you look at how we live now to how our ancestors live, you know, they, they needed to be safe in a very different way than we are. You know, we are safe. We don't have lions to run away from. So we're mm -hmm. running away from emotions and they're right. not going to kill us. So right. that's when I think that we need to like, just, just take, take a moment and just reflect and see, you know, is, is, is this actually serving right now? Right. So there is a good ego and then there is an ego that prevents you from being able to be the best that you can be. And yeah, so, I think like you were like you said so well that you know it holds you back because it, it definitely does. Like your ego is trying to keep you safe, mm -hmm. but when you're in a safe, comfortable place, you don't grow. Mm -hmm. We don't grow out of comfort, right? We exactly. grow out of discomfort. So just like you were saying, you know, it it, it holds you back, but at the same time, it is there to protect you. So you it's know? like a fine line, and you got to know what that balance is. Balance it out. Mm -hmm. I love that. Right. And when so it comes to be... supporting others, you cannot come from, from your ego because if you want to su truly support someone else, mm -hmm. it's not about you. Right. That's okay. exactly right. That is exactly right. I, I love that you said that because a lot of people, well, you think about this too. If they're sitting in their comfort zone, they make it about them. Hmm. because that's what they're comfortable about. They're comfortable surrounding themselves in their own thoughts, their own emotions. Yeah. When you stretch yourself and you get yourself out of that comfort zone, then it doesn't become about you. It becomes about what you can do for others. Hmm. What can you do to stretch yourself to reach out and help others? Because helping other people is not comfortable. It is mm -hmm. not comfortable at all. There's a lot of stretching that happens. There's a lot of challenges that happens when it comes to helping somebody else. But you're also putting yourself out there, which can be extremely uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. let's go into the the what your don't is. What is yeah. your number one don't? Yeah, the, the, the number one don't, that, and this is a big one, and it's avoidance. And, okay. Um, yeah, this this is a big one. And it's ironically the one that I think very many people think is the most innocent. Um, you know, so this can look as this can look as simple as, you know, seeing somebody in the grocery store that, you know, have gone through a tough time or are going through a tough time and you're seeing them a couple of aisles down. And you go like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'll just pretend like I don't see them and carry on. Mm -hmm. The problem is that somebody in somebody who's grieving or having a tough time, they're already in a position where they feel like outsiders, right? Mm -hmm. You're already so vulnerable that you have these heightened senses. And mm -hmm. I can say from my own experience as well, I could tell straight away when somebody was avoiding me, mm -hmm. you know, you get so, so sensitive to it. And mm -hmm. it is so painful. Because and, and this is, wow, it's, it's ingrained in us, you know, as a human survival, because for our ancestors, being shunned meant death, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so important for us. We, we feel it so strongly, even though it doesn't mean death anymore. Emotionally, the toll is still as strong. Right. So it's, it's, um, so that's one part of it, right? It's just the, whenever somebody's trying to go like, oh, I don't know what to say. I'm just going to. I'm just going to pretend like nothing and, and move away. You know, that that's like a, a punch in the gut for the other person. And then they feel like, oh, yeah, that's confirmation. I am an outsider. So let me ask you a question on avoidance. So yeah. what I'm hearing is that when you have just lost somebody and, uh, you know, somebody that you normally talk to, that you consider an acquaintance or a friend, they're avoiding you, avoiding to speaking with you because they don't know what to say. What would you do in that aspect? Would you go up to them and say, hi, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, you look beautiful today or, you know, just just to show them it's OK to approach you? Or how would you handle that? You mean as the um, the non person? 
No, as so like let's say I like hypothetically, I was the one that lost mm-hmm. somebody that I love. Yeah. And then I see a friend that I normally talk to all the time, you know, in the grocery mm-hmm. store. But they I can obviously see they're trying to avoid me because maybe they're not sure how to approach me because I just lost somebody and they don't want to, you know, cause me to be upset or something. So they go on their way. Do I go up to them to let them know that I'm in a safe place and you, they, they, it's okay to say hi? Or, you know, how would you handle that? And then let's flip it on the opposite side and talk about somebody who you know that had just lost somebody. You know, how would you handle that as well? Mm, okay. Yeah. So, um, well, if you have just lost somebody, then you probably won't be strong enough to do that. Like if you are strong enough to go up to somebody and and tell them like, Hey, I'm okay. You know, you can come talk to me. I'd like that. Then that's amazing. Um, but that is hard to do like that. Mm -hmm. That's very, very difficult, especially when you are so vulnerable and down, like I said, it's, I remember my first times around to the grocery store after losing my daughter and and I was I was struggling to stay on my feet just going up and down the aisles you know there was no chance I would have been able to to go up and confront people in that manner mm-hmm. um but at the same time what we did a bit later was because my daughter was in kindergarten um when she when she passed away well she mm-hmm. was at home but she started kindergarten so after i don't remember how much time had passed weeks or months i don't know it was kind of confusing mm-hmm. in the time but um me and my husband invited the kindergarten teachers to our house mm-hmm. to and we they came over and they sat down and and we started talking to them like we if you have we understand if you guys have any questions maybe you want to ask us and you know, because we knew that our other daughter was in that kindergarten, you know, and nobody knew anything and people are talking and they have to deal with the kids. They have to support our daughter and all the other kids are going to be asking questions. That was brilliant for you guys to do that, by the way, to, yeah. you know, because you were thinking about your daughter and her experience mm-hmm. in school and you wanted to speak to the teachers. That was brilliant. Mm-hmm. I don't think many yeah, parents also, know to do that. Yeah. And also the other kids, right? Because they mm-hmm. just, you know, even though they're young, they, they they just suddenly like one of one of their own was gone right right which is not a normal thing to happen so mm-hmm. so we invited them to the house and and we had a really nice long chat and they were able to ask us questions so in you know initially when they came you could see they were all kind of like they were really nervous um mm-hmm. about coming they were not saying anything everybody was quiet by the time they left they were like oh thank you so much for having us thank you so much for like I never would have expected that this this could have worked and and that you were able to do this and let us know this and we really really appreciate it That's and you so can see that a weight had just been lifted off their shoulders right because they came there not like being all stressed out and that's what very often happens but we were able to do that together me and my husband because we were in a controlled environment right mm-hmm. we invited them home into our living room and we had set the stage for it which made us a bit stronger and able yes. to do it. And we had the motivation, right? We had a reason to do it. But in a in a passing, like out on the street where there's so much else going on, I wouldn't have been able to do that myself. Yeah. I you know what? I'm gonna tell you something. For you and your husband to do something like that, um, first of all, they could have been the one that was doing the avoidance. They were avoiding having that conversation with the two of you and, you know, and fear that it might cause some other emotions come up or, you know, cause you guys to have some deep um, grief in front of them. And maybe they were fearful of that. But for you to show them the strength that you had to bring them into your home, to talk about the scenario and the situation for your daughter that was in their classes um, I just want to tell you that's inspiring, very, very inspiring. And I hope that there's other listeners that if you have children that are in school and they have other classmates, if you get an opportunity to speak with their teachers, I highly recommend it just like Tanya did and her husband did, because Tanya, do you feel like that experience actually set the tone for the rest of her school years? Oh, yeah. 
I definitely think so. We um, we've had such a close relationship with the with the kindergarten ever since that. And you know, my my older daughter, they would um, they would hold space for her in a way mm-hmm. that I don't know if they would have been able to do if we hadn't let them in to understand what she was going through. Um, because, you know, they she used to see her sister in kindergarten every day, you know, they had mm-hmm. uh, classrooms right next to each other and they used to go visit each other. Mm-hmm. So for her to be in the kindergarten without her sister, you know, it was traumatic. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were able to then, you know, take care of her in, in a very different way. And I think they could do it without fear. They could do it comfortably, right? So they could see like, okay, we understand. Oh, wow. That is a beautiful turn of events though. Um, Mm -hmm. You taking something so um, painful and turning it in something so beautiful for your daughter to help her. Um, Gosh, I just want to hug you right now. That's so amazing. (laughs) That is really amazing. Um, we have a few more minutes left. So um, you have you want to give suggestions on how somebody can help a loved one who's grieving during the holidays. So we do have holidays coming up. I'm certain there's quite a few events coming up. What is your suggestion to how somebody can help, you know, their loved one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, I love this. Um, yeah. So obviously it's going to depend on the, on the phase that they're in and, and, uh, but as long as they're not like in the, the, the worst phase, like the despair, um, mm-hmm. then the there's, there's a couple of things you can do. But the biggest thing, the first off, the biggest thing, like we said, get out of your ego. It's not about you. Mm-hmm. Look at what's good for them. And holidays are so loaded with traditions that things are just done in this certain way. And this is how we've always done. And this is how it's going to be done. And there's so many, there's so many, um things going on that can be triggers Mm -hmm. so one of the big thing is um setting new traditions right exploring if there's something new you can do I loved what you were saying before you know when you were talking about hanging up a picture and setting a plate Mm -hmm. for them um but it can also be something like just changing the order that you're doing things in right Mm -hmm. if you always if you've always um, had a Medic. song before you have your dinner, you know, maybe, okay, yeah. have the dinner and then do the song. Just changing things up a little bit. Talk to the person who's grieving and ask them, is there something that you'd like to do different? Is there a way that we can incorporate the the person who's gone into it? Um, we actually do, you know, what you were saying with the picture. We have her picture always with us. Um, and we actually have her ashes in, in a like a heart-shaped urn right Mm -hmm. in the we have like an open living room kitchen so it's right Mm -hmm. there by us all the time and we always light a candle for her so you know we we always have that there and then we have a little other other things that we incorporate into it just to to have her with us Mm -hmm. um and then so that's something that other people can do as well is just show that understanding and ask and see like is there something that you would like to do differently is there some way we could do it um that can honor the memory Mm. but the other side of it is to uh hold space and leave space for them so a big thing for us that made the holidays become good again was that we we stopped trying to fulfill everybody else's wants from us so whereas uh christmas before used to be oh we have to go dinner there we have to do this and then we have to do that we just stopped. We just went like, okay, no, if we're going to survive Christmas, we have to do it our way. And we just have to do what feels good. Um, and, and that has, that's worked brilliantly for us. So as the grieving, that's what you need to do. You need to give yourself space. You need to allow yourself to not run yourself ragged. You don't have to go do all sorts of things, you know, find what's actually nice and find some quiet time, find some quiet space, you know, be by yourself a little bit and then come back in. If you need a timeout, go have a timeout. And for the supporters, you need to see that you have to um, give them this space. So if you're at a, um, if you're, for example, having a dinner party and they're coming to your 
house for it. You could set aside a little space, a little quiet room where they can go and be by themselves if they need to time out, for example. Are you still there? Okay. I really hope that you were still recording with just you. <laughs> it says <laughs> the recording still. Yeah. And we still okay. have 54 yeah. minutes. For the viewers, what just happened, I just lost internet for a split second. Things like this happen all the time, but I'm certain you probably still heard what Tanya was saying because it was continuously recording. But um, you know what? I, I'm just going to tell you something. Uh, this is a very sad story, but this podcast cannot come any more perfect timing because um, there is a there, there's a story and it's, it's hits very close to a very family friend of mine who, um, it was her, um, cousin that had passed away. Um, and this, so it's this huge in a local area where we're at. And, um, so there was a, a group of, uh, people was a, a man and his girlfriend and then, um, and the cousin, and then they had their three kids. There was three kids in the back seat of the car and they were on a vacation trip from Florida. They were in Col uh, Connecticut at the time. And for whatever reason, we don't know what happened other than they ended up in this car accident. And the first, the, the adults all, um, passed away in the car accident. The children, or all sent to a hospital with critical injuries. And this literally just happened a few weeks ago. And um, so they're, they, they have a lot of family, a lot of people that are just like grieving right now from this loss and from this tragedy that happened. And um, I, I really feel like this particular episode, I'm going to gift it to them. Mm -hmm. um, I would love for them to, to use this because I think from the things that you shared, Tanya, and the things that we talked about in this podcast is going to help them get through the holidays this year um, after losing uh, these beautiful people. Uh, they have have been through a lot of tragic situations. You know, these, these children are going to wake up without their parents. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, it's, it's a very sad, sad moment. Um, but like we, we've talked about, we've got to keep their memories alive. We've mm -hmm. got to talk about the positive things about those that we've lost and, um, always keep a picture of them. Keep a, keep a chair open for them. Like you said, light a candle for them. Um, these things are so super important to help those that are healing from this. And those of us that want to support those that are healing, um, be there for them. Mm. You know, if they need somebody to talk to, be the one that they can talk to. Um, you can be the listener, um, you know, share, share some love, send flowers to them, um, bring food to them. They probably are in a point where they're, it's going to be hard for them to even cook, uh, let alone get a gathering of family. Just see if there's something that you can offer to the family that are missing them. You know, um, that's my suggestion. Do you have any suggestions for them, Tanya? Yeah, I guess the, um, you know, just emphasizing again, the giving space, like making sure that like, they don't have to follow traditions this year, they don't have mm -hmm. to do what you're supposed to do and follow the rules and the, the way things normally go and normally set, let them do what they're comfortable with and don't push anything more. Um, and then the last thing I would add to that would just be, don't expect a thank you. Yes. Um, and by that, I mean that, you know, it's, it's not that they're not thankful, but they mm -hmm. just, they're just overwhelmed. That's, that's not, you know, that's not what they can focus on. You think you might come later on, um, but, but don't, don't expect it right now. Just know that it's, you're there to serve them, not to be thanked. Yes. You know, that was a uh, really awesome suggestion because most people don't think about that. You know, some people think, oh, well, I did this and that for them, but they didn't say thank you. Well, don't don't have expectations on that because yeah. they really, you know, they, they're not even thinking about anything right now other than the grief that they're dealing with at this moment. So, yeah. Tanya, you are a beautiful person. Thank you so much for sharing. I cannot wait to see this three phase as three phases of grief course that you have coming. 
Um, I know that's going to be a huge hit. A lot of people are going to be needing that tremendously, um, especially after dealing with the holidays. They're going to need something to fall back on. And so you having it available for the first of the year. You said to go on to your your website and your Instagram to um, keep following that and look out for it, correct? Yes. Yes. Look out for the announcement. Okay, perfect. Um, Do you have any last words you'd like to share with us before we end the podcast? No, Um, just just give yourself time, like give everybody time, right? Be patient and just get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tanya, for your time. I so appreciate you. And I look forward to having you back with us again in the future. So you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate <laughs> talking to you. And you're such a beautiful soul. So I appreciate everything you shared as well. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you.